Okay, so welcome back. We're now ready to talk about maximum likelihood estimation of the Tobin model. Okay, so here, here are the quantities of interest, okay? I mean, recall that we have the model here, the Tobit model, right? Where you would observe some, uh, basically some, some observed variable Y that was like the maximum of zero and some latent variable where we have a model for the latent variable that's a linear index, okay? So that's our model. That's the model we wanna write up the likelihood for, okay? So now the observational rule pretty, you know, it provides two cases, okay? In the case where you got a censoring well, then you got the density for the, um, or, or, or where y is equal to zero, you got the, the a probability mass for y equal to zero, okay? We call that F zero, okay? And then in the other case, you have another density uh, that's a continuous density when y is positive, okay? And then the, the density function can be written basically com condensed based on these two cases. Either you have a positive, you have a, uh, 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 y equal to zero, or you have y being positive, and then you pick either of these two, okay? So this is these two, two cases, okay? And here, you know, this is the indicator function, okay? Um, this one. And then what we do is basically we split the density function into two parts that are similar, just similar to what we did with binary response models. Okay, you got these two different, different outcomes, two different densities, and then depending on which case you're in, you're gonna pick one or the other. And so what are they, these expressions look, looking like? Okay, now K zero, you have a mass point at zero uh, or at the mass point um, at, at zero. So here the distribution, well, that's the probability that Y is equal to zero, this, this, this density at, at that point, that, that's that probability condition on X, which is basically Y star smaller than, um, probability of Y star smaller than zero. We've seen that before, that that would be like uh, similar to, to the proper case that we analyzed when we looked at binary response models. So that's like one minus Xi beta, uh, one minus the CDF of the standard normal of Xi beta divided by sigma. See here, it's important that I include, uh, uh, I include sigma because now we are not making any normalizations about the, the, the error term here. We're assuming this guy here is standardly normal with, with variance uh, sigma squared. So we need to account for that. And then it's a question, of, can we, then the question is, can we identify it? We'll look at that later, okay? Um, so we'll, we're back. This is essentially just this, the, the, uh, the problem, uh, very similar to the probability of y equal to zero in the, uh, in the appropriate case, okay? So, um, well, it's identical to it. Then we have the other case. Well, in the other case where we have a continue, the, the continuous part of the distribution, well, this is normally distributed, that part of the distribution. So that density, well, that's a density from a normal distribution with a standard deviation of sigma. And, and then the mean that, well, that's gonna be the, the, the uh, uh, evaluated at the, at the residual, okay? It's because, you know, the residuals are, have mean zero. So you just, you know, sub subtract the mean of that range of variable, which is X beta, okay? So like this conditional mean. And then you got your, your density for that part of the distributions. And this is completely similar to, to the, uh, the, you know, the, the density that enters into the likelihood for the linear regression model. So essentially you have like two parts of the distribution, either, you know, Y is equal to zero, you got the probability from uh, that are similar to what you see in the pulpit. And, and then other, in the other case where Y is positive, well, you have a, a density that's um, similar to the case of, uh, of the uh, normal linear regression. And then we put these things together and this is what we get. So we get this, this density function, conditional density for Y I conditional on our observed values of, of X I, okay? I think I need a bracket up here, sorry about that. Why don't I just, no, I don't wanna fix it now. Okay. Um, so, then we move on uh, and, and see here, this uh, basically we wanna take the, compute the log of the likelihood ba based on that density. And first let's just talk a little bit about what, what are the parameters here, okay? I mean, let's suppose we can identify both beta and sigma. Well, we, we wanna try to estimate that, those. So, so theta, that's our parameter vector, that's beta and sigma. You can also have like an alternative parameterization where you say your parameters are beta and, and sigma squared. So, and, and actually that's what you know, people normally do. I'm just gonna do the other way around. So to be, then you can see uh, this, this, this way, that's, that's how it's written in the book, okay? Um, 
So here the the uh, here's the individual uh, contribution. Okay, so you got basically your your your, your log of the log of one probability, the log of the other probability, and then these indicator functions they move down front. The last part can be simplified a little bit, right? Because you know this is the density of a standard normal, and this is something with you know uh, uh, there's there's something with with uh, uh, um, you know square root of pi and exp uh, and the, uh, the one over the square root of uh, pi times two uh, times the standard deviation to the exponential of uh, of of, uh, of of the residual divided by the sigma and then the whole thing squared. So the, you know there's an exponential there in there, and that exponential that's going to be eaten by the log once we take we we take the log of that that density, and then this simplifies. You get this very nice expression. And the reason why I want to do it is because it's much easier to differentiate. Uh, this additive function than than uh, um, uh, if you you know if you have to do it all by parts oh it's not a big deal but you know that's that's what we do right so here's the uh, basically the sample objective function to be minimized and then um, so so it's not the likelihood function right the likelihood function that would be the sum of all the likelihoods okay and and but just to ma make the link to the the way Woolrich is presenting. Uh, the objective functions in the in the context of say chapter um, uh, chapter twelve and thirteen. Well, uh, we we would like to formulate so that we have objective function sample objective function that could be minimized, and that's exactly what we have here. So we have the negative of the average of the local likelihood contributions, okay. and 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 so uh, there is an, a Python implementation of that, and and basically what we have this is the key line right. Uh, all this stuff here is, is essentially just the same definitions as, as you have on the previous slide. I'm not going to go through it. Now you just have it in the slide deck for completeness. And it's a good exercise to see, you know, move forth and back here or open it as a notebook and see, can you make the link between the code I'm writing here and what you have on this previous slide? Okay. So, um, and hopefully you can. Okay. And if you can't, you know, you know, go in and debug and look at the different parts. The bottom line is we now have an objective function for the Topet model that has these two different components uh, that has a log uh, of the, the one minus the probability of, of uh, y star being positive. And then you have the, the case here with the, lin the, the linear regression uh, uh, likelihood. Anyway, so let's just move on and try to use it. Um, but before we use it, I also want to talk about how to actually uh, get the, the scores in the first order conditions. Uh, and, and we need that for optimization and also for calculating uh, the variance covariance matrix. Remember that you know, the variance covariance matrix depends on the derivatives of the objective function and sometimes even on the second order derivatives uh, in, in case you're not in, in maximum likelihood world. So it could be like uh, you know, either you use the outer product of a gradient or you use this sandwich formula, you use the, the Hessian to form your, your, your variance covariance matrix and then you need to take the inverse and divide by n. Okay, so anyway, there's a good motivation for doing this uh, because the optimizer also need derivatives. And so here is essentially the, the derivatives of that or all those likelihood contributions with respect to the two different parameters that we are looking at, beta and, and sigma, and, and, um, and, and they have these uh, particular functional forms. What you see here is really, uh, if you look at the coefficients where we are differentiating with respect to beta, well, it's it's very much yeah. What you this this part here would cancel out, and we, you would essentially only have this part here saying that the residuals times x that would have, be, have, to, have to be equal to zero uh, on uh, on average in the sample, right? So that's like you know the same as saying that the uh, explanatory variables need to be uncorrelated with the procedures. This is how you get OLS, right? So this is this is OLS if you just do that, right? And then uh, then there, but then there's this last part here um, uh, that is accounting for uh, the the truncation incidence or the censoring incidence uh, that you have at zero. And and this is what we'll see later is this is similar to this is actually the conditional mean of a of a, uh, uh, of a truncated um, or, uh, normal that is equal to the conditional mean of the residual for y being positive, that has to be correlated with x in, in this case. Okay. 
Anyway, so so uh, the expressions are here, and you can derive a similar expression with di di differentiating with respect to sigma. Note, I'm not differentiating with respect to sigma squared. You could do that, but then you would, uh, you know, you would have to treat theta squared as your parameter, which is very popular. That's, a, that's actually what most people do. I just chose to do it the other way uh, because, yeah, that's how I did. Okay, so here, here's a routine that calculates what you had just had a previous slide. Essentially, these are just reminiscent of the, the same formulas that you just saw. Uh, so you got all these, these scores and then I'm gonna put them together and return that, okay? So, so that's, that's, that's all good. So why don't we just try it out, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, again, uh, this is a good exercise. Go and look at the code, try to see if you can add it up with the formulas. If there's an uh, error in one place, you know, please let me know. I, I think it's all right. So now we're ready to, to estimate this model. And, and essentially what we're doing is we're minimizing this objective function using these derivatives I showed you on, on this slide here, uh, uh, sending that to the optimizer. So I put these um, uh, yeah, put the rev equal to one, meaning that you're you're using those derivatives, uh, and and then it pot, pot, uh, plots out some some standard output here, and and probably should zoom in a little bit, um, and and so here what you see is we we got our our parameters there is supposed to be negative two and one and and uh, and minus one, so we have like three regresses, the first being a constant. And then we have a standard deviation of one in the residual, okay? And, and we're able to estimate all these parameters right back uh, with, this, the, with the Tobit model, okay? Even though we were having all these uh, mass points and so on. So we, we have basically derived the distribution for the observed variable y, and then we derive the likelihood conditional on, on those explanatory variables, we maximized it. And then we got these results. And, and it turns out that, that this Tobit model, when you maximize that likelihood or minimize that, that sample function that's negative of the average of the likelihood, well, then you actually get the true parameters. Okay, so that's actually, and that's also a good test when you're doing stuff like this. You, you, you try it out on simulated data first, and then you see, can you get the parameters right back? Okay, so then we, we for, for now, we until now we actually assumed that, that theta and the sigma squared is, is identifiable, okay? And, and something looks like it is an identifiable because we're not identifiable. If, if, if we cannot identify sigma, well, we cannot consistently estimate it. And we did a pretty good job of actually getting that one. I mean, you can, you can change that number. You see down here that now it changed from one to two. Uh, if you change the true parameter from one to two, okay? So it's not like a coincidence or anything. So it looks like we can, we can actually figure out where that, uh, what that, this, that sigma is. So it looks like it's ident identifiable. And then the question is, is that always the case? It was not identifiable in the probit model, right? I mean, remember in the probit model, we, 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 cannot, we can only identify beta divided by sigma, not beta and sigma separately, okay? But it turns out that in this case, we can. And see, uh, the issue is that now we suddenly have continuous variation in the latent variable for part of that distribution that is observed. So we do observe Y star when Y star is positive, okay? That's not the case for the probit model. It, when Y star was positive in the probit model, well, we would just observe that Y was equal to one. Not, we would not observe Y star. So that part of the, that continuous variation in distribution, well, that allows us to identify sigma uh, squared, okay, or sigma. Um, so, so then, you know, can you think of some examples where this identification would break down? Well, what if all the data that was censored, right? It, essentially all the variation in all the, the, basically all the observations were censored. You just observed that they were all zero, okay? That case, it's, it's kind of trivial. But in that case, you cannot identify. And it turns out also, if you want to estimate these models are, uh, and, and, and actually some of the, um, the, the underlying assumptions for this open model are violated, it turns out that the amount of uh, observations that are not truncated uh, has, has, means a lot to how precise we can actually estimate it or how robust our estimator is to, to those specifications. Um, so uh, here, yeah, now what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna 
essentially try to see if I can estimate the model if I, I, I created a lot of truncation. And now I have like 99%, uh, almost 100% of the data is truncated. Yet we, was actually, we were actually able to estimate the model, uh, all the parameters of the model. Standard errors are much bigger, but of course, if I increase this further, this parameter, well, it, it completely breaks down, right? There's no variation in the data. But, but see, in the case where there's a lot of truncation, we start to really rely on the distributional assumptions, the fact that the errors are normally distributed. And, and that makes a big difference how, in terms of how sensitive our estimates are to the failure of satisfying those assumptions, how many of the observations that, that are central. We'll talk more about that. Okay, now um, that was all about estimation. Uh, and, and actually this estimation thing is completely the same for, for both of those cases I mentioned up front, both the, uh, sensor, the data censoring case and the Kuno solution, Kuno solution outcome case. It's the same model. We estimate the same way. We get the parameters uh, in the same way. We can identify the same parameters. Uh, but then it turns out that where they're really different, these two cases, is what is it that we're really interested to make inferences about? And that's what I'm going to talk about in, in, in the next video.